Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about efficiency and bridge rectifiers or full wave rectifiers or as some people call them full bridge rectifiers. But I'm not really interested in the average puny four diode rectifier that you might be familiar with but rather with this sort of monstrosity. The active bridge rectifier, a far more interesting and complex circuit but one which can also offer far more efficiency. So if you're curious about what sort of problems are associated with the classical rectifier and how these can be addressed using the active rectifier circuit, then keep watching. So how is a rectifier inefficient? What sort of problems does it have? Well, efficiency is related to power consumption and dissipation. How much of the power that goes into a circuit actually comes out the other way. And how much gets wasted as heat. For the same output power, the more heat you generate, the more inefficient the circuit is. So what's wrong with the classical bridge rectifier? Well, let's start off by looking at the more simple circuit first. The single diode rectifier. So when you apply an AC single to the left side, the diode will only conduct the positive voltage, letting it through onto the load. The negative voltage is completely blocked off. Now, to get the diode conducting, first of all you need a higher voltage potential on the anode than on the cathode, but to get the charges moving through the diode, you also need to apply a sufficiently large amount of voltage. So, to get the diode conducting, you will need to forward bias it, and there will be a forward voltage dropping on the diode. So, no matter what voltage you apply on the input, on the output you will get a slightly smaller voltage. So the voltage difference being the voltage drop on the diode. Now, although for simplicity the forward voltage drop on a PN junction diode is typically considered to be 0.7 volts, it's not that simple. So if we have a look into a datasheet, we'll see that the forward voltage drop is current dependent, temperature dependent, and well, diode dependent. So if we take as an example the 1N4000 series, so these are 1 ampere rated diodes and we have a look into some graphs. So here we see the typical forward voltage drop. We see that there are multiple curves for different temperatures. The higher the temperature of the junction, the lower the voltage drop will be. But we can also see that this voltage drop is current dependent. So at the rated 1 amperes at 25 degrees, we have just a bit above 0.9 volts of voltage drop on this particular diode. Now, if we look at a different diode, so for example the S3 series from Diotech, and we look for the same curves, so again we see that at higher temperatures we get a different graph with lower voltages. At 1 amperes, the voltage drop on this diode is just above the 1 volt mark, so it's larger than with the previous diode. And at 3 amperes, the rated current for this diode at a junction temperature of 25 degrees, we have almost 1.1 volts of forward voltage drop. So if we do pass this 3 amperes with the diode, with the 1.1 volts voltage drop on the diode, we will be dissipating 3.3 watts. That's a lot. Now coming back to the bridge rectifier, the nice thing about this circuit is that it allows both positive and negative halves of the input voltage to pass on into the final load. The downside though is that through both of these cycles, the current is passing through two diodes. So the voltage difference between input and output is now two forward voltage drops. So if we take the average 1.1 volt that we looked at previously and an average current of 3 amperes, the power dissipation on the bridge rectifier would be 6.6 .6 watts. That's a lot. But wait, it gets even worse. So one common use case for a rectifying diode is to rectify a 50 or 60 hertz AC supply. So you take your sine wave, pass it through the diode, and you power your load with this. And if we do this, well, we only see the positive half of the supply voltage. Now, usually you don't want your supply voltage to look like this, so you'll also be adding a buffer capacitor, something to smooth out the voltage a bit. So when we also add a capacitor, we get a smoother voltage. But this has a couple consequences. So first of all, because the capacitor doesn't completely discharge in between 
successive sine waves, the diode will not be conducting for half of the period. So only when the voltage on the capacitor is smaller than the voltage on the input, only then will the diode be conducting. And since the diode is conducting for shorter periods of time, it will be working at higher currents. So in our first example, we have 180 degrees approximately of conduction angle, we have a nice sine wave, but in our second example, the diode is conducting for much shorter periods of time at much higher currents. And well, this leads to a couple problems. Because the current is larger, the voltage drop will be larger on the diode, so you will be having higher power dissipations. In the first case, we're getting peaks of 50 something milliwatts. In the second case, we're getting almost one watt peaks. And even if we integrate this, so the average for the first case was 15 milliwatts, for the second case, it's 47 milliwatts. And well, the larger the capacitor that you use, so here I have the same circuit with a 10,000 microfarad capacitor, you will be getting a much smoother voltage, but the current will be even larger. So the larger the capacitor is, the higher the peak currents and the higher the power dissipation you will be getting on your diode. So what can be done about this? How can we reduce the power dissipation? Well, one way is to use better diodes. And by better, I mean of different type, namely the Schottky diode. In a simplified view of things, this type of diode has only about 0.3 volts of forward voltage drop on it. So it should be far more efficient. Now, in practice, under certain conditions, it's better than the PN junction diode. But that's not the general rule though. Now, with a Schottky diode, the same basic effects occur as with a normal PN junction diode, so higher temperature means lower forward voltage drop and higher current means higher voltage drop. But there's one more very important characteristic parameter, which is related to the reverse voltage rating. So with a typical PN junction diode, so this data sheet is valid for diodes ranging from 50 volts up to 1000, the forward voltage drop is the same on all of them. So it doesn't matter if you have the 50 volt diode or the 1000 volt diode, you get the same graph. Now with Schottky diodes, so as an example I took the 3 ampere 40 volt rated diode, so MBRS340, this has a voltage drop at the rated 3 amperes and 25 degrees of about 4.5 volts. But if we now look to the 100 volt version of this diode, so the MBRS300, so same 3 amperes but 100 volt rating, we can see that at 25 degrees and 3 amperes, we get close to 0.8 volts of forward voltage drop. So the voltage rating of the diode has a very big impact in the forward voltage drop. Higher rated voltage diodes have higher voltage drops. So because of this increasing voltage drop with higher voltage rating, normally you won't really see Schottky diodes rated to more than 200 volts. Because at that point, most of the advantages that you got by going to the Schottky technology are well outweighed by the various problems that you're getting. And since Schottky diodes are more expensive than regular PN junction diodes, usually you'll be using these specifically at relatively low voltages. So where their price increase corresponds to the benefits that you're getting. So under certain cases, Schottky diodes are better but we still are getting quite large power dissipations. How can we make more significant improvements? Well, if we look back in time a bit, namely in the vacuum tube era, you almost never see a circuit with a four diode bridge rectifier. There's a good reason for this. Other than the sheer size of the vacuum tube diode components, it has to do with the forward voltage drop. Tubes are way worse than silicon diodes. So the standard easy 80 power rectifier has about 15 volts of voltage drop at only 40 milliamps. And when you increase the current, so does the voltage drop. So it was way easier to just put double windings on transformers and use only two diodes than to have a single winding with four diodes. Now, the similar approach is still used to this day in isolated switching converters. You get a more efficient design with double windings and two diodes then you get with a single winding and four diodes. But this only works if you have a transformer to generate the two out of phase voltages. If not, you're stuck with the four diode arrangement. But there still is hope. This is where things get a bit more interesting. So this is the most basic form of active or ideal diode that you can build. It's built with a MOSFET with the gate tied to ground. So the way in which this circuit works 
is that when you're applying an AC signal on the input, while the negative part gets blocked, the positive part first of all passes through the built-in diode, but once enough voltage reaches the gate source of the transistor, then the transistor switches on. So rather than having the forward voltage defined by some relatively fixed parameter, like with semiconductor diodes, once the transistor is on, the forward voltage will be defined by the current passing through it and the on resistance of the transistor. So the output voltage should look something like this. So first the diode is conducting, then the transistor switches on when the threshold voltage is reached, and then well the output voltage is almost identical to the input voltage. So if we take, for example, a 3 ampere current and an on resistance of say 10 milliohms, the complete voltage drop will be only 30 millivolts. So a completely different voltage magnitude than we've seen previously. So let's make our rectifying bridge from this sort of circuits. Well, there's just one catch. This sort of ideal diode is very good at blocking negative voltages. It will not let any sort of negative voltage pass through it. But when you are applying a positive voltage, the transistor does not care which way the current is flowing. So as long as there's sufficient voltage between the gate and the source, current can come in into the load or it can go out. So when you add a capacitor on the output of this sort of circuit, if you leave it as it is, this sort of diode will also let the capacitor discharge while still maintaining positive voltage polarity. But this circuit is not completely useless though. So just to show this circuit off, I prepared it here in the simulator. So I built the N channel version of this sort of circuit. And while well, I also added the resistor in the gate and the thinner diode. The idea here being that you want to protect the gate source of the transistor so you don't exceed the voltage rating that the transistor has. So that's why you will be also adding this sort of resistor and diode arrangement. And well, if we run the circuit, even though we have a capacitor on the output, we can see the voltage on the output following the voltage on the input. So we have this rise and fall of the voltage. So the current through the transistor goes both ways, charging and discharging. Now, we can get rid of this effect by also adding a normal diode. So with this circuit, where we also have this regular Schottky diode, the output now looks as expected. But now, why bother having the active diode if you also need the normal diode? Well, this circuit becomes far more interesting when we double it. So what we can build is a bridge rectifier where two of the diodes are normal diodes and two of the diodes are this sort of active circuit. So by having the normal diodes, we'll only have forward conduction, but by having these active circuits, the total voltage drop on the bridge will be just slightly higher than with a single diode. So we'll have the voltage drop on one diode and then we'll have the voltage drop on the on resistance of the transistors. So if we also add a capacitor, we have a nice smooth output voltage and the bridge is working like a bridge rectifying both halves of the input signal. But can we take this idea one step further to somehow replace all of the classical diodes? Well, of course we can. But first we need a better ideal diode circuit to do that. So the next best thing is a bit more complicated, but it does allow for proper diode-like behavior. So by driving the transistor using an operational amplifier or a comparator, you can very accurately measure the voltage before and after the circuit and only when the input voltage is larger than the output will the transistor be turned on. Now this circuit of course relies on the fact that the transistor when it's on it still has a finite on resistance and current passing through it from left to right will cause a voltage drop and this will cause the drain to be at a higher potential than the source in this particular case. Now, it's also important to mention that to get this thing working correctly, you need an operational amplifier that has a very small offset voltage. So the internal offset of the op amp needs to be smaller than whatever voltage will drop on the transistor, so that a correct comparison can be performed under all conditions. So to show this type of circuit out, I prepared this schematic in which I'm only rectifying half of the input signal, so to keep things simple, but we have our more complex active diode and the more basic circuit coming together. So with this type of 
comparator-based circuit, you will need a few more components than just the transistor and the comparator, so I added some resistors to protect the gates, I added the local supply capacitor and the diode that prevents this capacitor from discharging when the output voltage goes lower, but if we run the circuit and we look at the output, we see that it's what we expect. So we have quite a smooth output voltage with a specific voltage drop occurring because of the capacitance value. And now, just to see how good the circuit is, we can compare it to the previous circuits that we've looked at. So I also prepared a circuit that has a Schottky diode and only one active diode. So this is outputting slightly lower voltages because of the voltage drop that's occurring on the Schottky diode. If we only use Schottky diodes, well then the voltage drop will go even lower. So we have two forward voltage drops on two diodes. And well, if we're using regular diodes, then the voltage goes even lower. And of course, when we compare all four of these cases to the reference, so this input signal without any sort of rectification, and we zoom in a bit, we can see that the closest we're getting to having an ideal neglectable voltage drop is with our fully active rectifying bridge. So the voltage drop will still be dependent on the on resistances of the transistors, but in general, you can make far better rectifiers using active rectification since you're no longer relying on relatively fixed voltage drops to polarize junctions, you're only relying on the on resistance of a transistor, which can be quite low. In the end, active rectifiers are an important consideration, not just when low frequency 50 or 60 Hz rectification is concerned, but active rectifiers also see wide use in things like power over ethernet applications or wireless power transfer. Anywhere where efficiency is of the utmost importance or where low voltages are being used. So if you're curious, I left a bit of documentation down below so you can go check that out. Now, the circuit doesn't have to be this complex. It can be far worse. There are some really interesting discrete designs out there where the complexity also brings a lot of advantages. But if you want to keep things simple, you also have dedicated active rectifier or ideal diode driver integrated circuits, for the right price of course. So these can directly drive a set of n-channel power transistors and be done with it. So you have proper gate driving without having to deal with the various limitations of the discrete circuits that we've looked at. In case power efficiency is an important factor for your application, active full bridge rectifiers are an important circuit to keep in mind. And since today we only looked at theoretical and simulation aspects, Next time, we will also look at some practical circuits. So until then, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to Beauty Data to videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.